So hello everyone, my name is Arash. Um, I walked into this class last semester not knowing anything about marketing. And all I knew was that I have to learn the basics of it at some point. And I got really fascinated by it because um, I started writing business plans and I noticed a huge part of a business plan or action plan is marketing. And that's really the difference between companies that go huge and big and companies that have a great product but might never actually get to certain stages. So um, it's I'm very excited for you guys that you guys are in this class. And I believe this class marks um, a certain point in your college career that really involves you to get involved with a lot of stuff. It's not just about a grade anymore. In my opinion, I believe that getting involved could really help you guys. So I'm not sure what company you guys are going to be doing a report on, but I'm going to share some things that I believe can truly help you guys to write a better report. And they're not really specific things. They're more general things, but they, they are the things that I did. And I believe they truly made the work easier on me. And it also developed my motivation to learn more. Is it okay if I share my screen, Professor? Yes, of course. Please. So I believe it's right. Yes. So I wrote five different um, steps with a six um, section for bonus points. So I'm going to run through it kind of fast. I, I hope we have time for questions at the end. Um, so the first part is understanding the assignment. Showing up to class and hearing about it is a different thing from actually understanding what needs to be done. So paying attention when professor is explaining the assignment. At the same time, going to office hours and actually asking about each section of the report and the specific of what goes into each section is very, very, very important. Um, the second part, which is also one of the main things that will bring you guys together as a team, is developing common definitions of, for example, marketing or SWOT analysis. A lot of times you have a team meeting and because we're students and we don't have the expertise within the area, I mean, that's why we're taking this class, we might, I might show up with this idea that marketing is about making more profit, but you might show up with this idea that marketing is about generating revenue. And even though those two things could be on the same board, developing a common definition of what marketing is and what their role it plays within different companies and industries is critical in doing actual in doing an actual report as a team. Um, also understanding SWOT analysis. I mean, SWOT is not that hard to understand, but learning how to differentiate between weaknesses and threats is important between strengths and opportunities. I think it's very important to learn how to differentiate between those, because if you play something that is a strength in opportunities, it can throw off the whole report. And that part, I believe, could be one of the toughest parts, differentiating opportunities from different, um, for example, strengths. But um, we'll get into it in section five about feedbacks. In, in terms of evaluating the company and the industry as a team, uh, once uh, when we got the company, I think it was Califia Farms, we really looked into the company and the industry they operated. So the basics of marketing within different industries could be different at times. For example, doing marketing within the um, tech industry could be different than doing marketing within the food and beverages industry. Now, not everything is super different, but some basics could be different. That's why it's important to understand the industry and the company, understand the basic financials of both of them. So who are the big boys in the industry? Um, where is the company at? Where are they trying to get at? What chunk of the market do they already have? What chunk of it do they have a potential of actually gaining in the next few years? That's also important to understand as a team. Once as a team, you understand the assignments, you have a common definition of um, marketing, SWOT analysis, and what needs to be done. You understand the company and the industry at a basic level. Then you, then you define specific, clear roles. So you don't tell your teammate, um, hey, yo, bro, show up with the strengths on Monday. You know, it's really important to really define strengths as a team, then really give it to someone and be like, okay, you show up on this day with your strengths. It's really important to have those roles in a clear way stated within a document, not just tell someone, state it within a document. The more clear someone's role is, the easier it is to actually for them to accomplish whatever goal they're setting. Um, group chats, shared docs, I'm sure you guys will use those. They, they can really come in handy. One of the main things um, that I said is gonna really help you differentiate between opportunities 
is also um, feedback. So not just feedback from professor, but from each other. Um, if I'm working on strengths and you're working on weaknesses, I have my brain is fresh in terms of looking at your looking at what you wrote down as weaknesses, and your brain is fresh in terms of looking at what I wrote down as strengths. So you guys can really get feedback from each other on what you guys did, and then once you have a complete more completed version of the report, you can go to Professor. I'm sure he's, he's going to be available for you guys, and look at different things that could be different. Um, you guys can really use um internet. You guys can go to YouTube. There's thousands of videos. Um, I mean, don't watch every single one, but some of them could be very helpful in terms of how to write a marketing report. Bonus points that this section is probably the most important part, in my opinion. Um, question objectives, be crazy. I know it's going to make you seem like a maniac in your group meetings, but um, question objectives. Um, I believe that um, crazy opportunities and crazy ideas are always born out of questioning objectives. So don't just make an assumption and move from there. Sometimes it's okay to question some assumptions. For example, let's say we're talking about a company that produces markers. Why aren't they producing, for example, this spray? This spray could have a very similar product line to the marker and it could be much more profitable. You can, I'm not sure how much space professor is gonna give you in terms of going that crazy, but questioning objectives, not just about this report in general, Mm -hmm. I find it very fascinating to question objectives. Um, lastly, financials have to be on board with whatever you're stating. So you can say, I have this insane idea of producing this instead of this or producing it in this way instead of that way. But financials have to be on board. If it doesn't make sense financially, you're really going to get a pat on the back, nothing more. There's no way that the company will do something that's not going to make sense financially. So financials are super important. Really, really, really try to, if you're coming up with an idea, really try to look in the financials of it. And don't just view this as something you can get a grade off because I'm sure um, the representative from the company is gonna come in. Yes, Professor? Um, well, this time it's, I've never done it this way. I did it around. So, so in your situation, what I found that was amazing is that you came in February and I said, okay, you guys find a way to make Califia farms better than what it, they're doing. Find some growth situation. And so you and all the students of that semester struggled to find opportunities that were disruptive, right? Not only you had to find a disruptive opportunity for the report that was due in May, but you had to present a disruptive opportunity in the Wells Fargo uh, fast pitch. And then you came back in June, from June and July, to further uh, express uh, disruptive opportunities. And that's why I found that this was very exemplary because you wanted to be uh, participate in all of my classes, but you really struggled with finding a really big opportunity in May in the report. Then oh. you ha it was not that easy to find a disruptive opportunity when you did the Wells Fargo. Then you came back in June, and I think it was like maybe towards the end of June, one day it was an um, office meeting and you came and you said, hey, we found this idea of making powder um, almond milk. And then I said, okay. And that was what you just said here. It's question the objective, you know, think outside of the box, think about opportunities, discover opportunities, be crazy. And then I looked at you and I said, hey, Arash, now today you're crazy. Now you're talking to me crazy. And then I said, okay, tell me why would there be a powder almond milk? You sound good, you sound crazy, keep going. And then you said, because of this, because of that, because of this, because of this. And then I stopped you, I said, enough. You're good to go now. You're gonna rock it, you're good to go. And I remember I had a big smile, you had a big smile, you went and then when you presented to the clients about two, three weeks after, the client was scratching her head. The day after she sent me an email and say, hey, I want the report, the best report, but I really want the one with the powder almond milk. Wow, They're, everybody is very interested to, to read that and to see that at Califia Farm. I mean, Califia Farm is a company that makes multi-billion dollar. They loved it, but they loved it because you really thought outside of the box. And I thought that was interesting because you went to, to all my classes and you were working at it. So it's, it's not a one day, you know, you didn't get that idea on day one. I mean, you got that idea after how many weeks working on it? So this time, listen to what I gave the students. I gave the opportunity. I told them, 
So it's not, so I told them, um, ima- so that's not the exact thing, but imagine someone is thinking of doing uh, powder almond milk. That's the opportunity. People want powder almond milk. Why would they want this opportunity and which company should be doing it? So the students don't realize that. That's a lot easier. I gave them the opportunity and they had to define which company and how to go about it versus you had to do it the whole thing without the opportunity. That's why it took you months to get to it. So I've never done it this way in 26 years. I've always given them the brand, Califia Farm, find the opportunity. And this is like jumping, not knowing if the parachute's gonna open, right? For you, the parachute opened three weeks before, the, before landing, you know? And after several months, and that's what I'm telling them, I give you the parachute, but tell me where you're landing and which, from which plane and all that. So they have a lot of freedom, and, but they're still struggling with it because they have to find additional opportunities that will go with that main opportunity. So it's not like a one opportunity does it all because it has already been implemented. So in your case, the powdered milk was never really been implemented versus in their situation, I gave them an opportunity that has been done by another company, but, but they didn't, they are not doing, it should be much bigger. So it's, you know. So if they come up with an opportunity, they can take that opportunity to a company. Let's say the opportunity is creating um, certain type of spray. They can take that opportunity to a company within the industry of, I don't know, creating. Yeah. So the opportunity, I'll tell you what it is. Maybe you can, you can uh, before you go, give, give them your feeling. So I told them, I came to them and I said, there is a, a product which is called grounded shoes. So grounded shoes is not a normal shoe, if you want, like a shoe, but it has a, a, a wire which goes under the shoe, which keeps your feet connected to earth. And that grounded shoe was created because there's these people who created that go after a, a movement which is called earthing. And earthing is that it's, it's good for your health if now and then you take your shoes off and you walk barefoot in order to release energy from your body into the earth and gain from the energy from earth into your body. So a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists, healthy people believe in this earthing thing and it has been implemented as an opportunity to make shoes that gets you to be earth so you don't have to take your shoes off. It's this wire allows you to be connected. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six brands but they are not the big brands that everybody knows. They're just startups that have been using it, but they haven't done very well with it. It's like not many people know, it's not super successful. And so I told them, the student says, here's the opportunity, her thing and the grounded shoes. How do you take it to the next level? So they have to, they have to find other opportunities to go with it. Maybe a company that's successful with yoga, they want to talk to the yoga people to, to buy that brand of, yoga with earthing grounded shoes what do you think i think actually like uh last week friday i was in my entrepreneurship it's a k um it's an independent study class but it has to do with entrepreneurship we were discussing fashion and clothes and a lot of um other stuff within that industry and one key thing that um came to my mind is that within that industry especially a, a city like la like la county I, the interesting about that industry is that how people's demand could be shifted or adjusted or made uh, or, or increased or decreased. They, that, that's interesting because I feel like something like an, a spray or, or a pen, there's certain demand for it. The demand creation is a possibility, but maybe not at the level that it is within the fashion industry. For example, look at it this way. If someone like Drake is wearing that shoe, that can really pick up in LA because in LA people have this idea they really feed off each other you go go to a party you see something next day you want it you don't care that you don't need it you want it because this person was wearing it and that um that type of vibe I don't think is available in um a city like Montana however it's available in LA so I feel like maybe using celebrities or some sort of you know, famous athletes could be really useful within the LA type of mindset of one person wearing it and it taking off. Yes. Because, because in my opinion, if you're going to explain to people the, how good this is for your health, chances are they're not going to go with it. But when they see 
10 other people going with it, they don't resist the change as much because they're not super scared of it. That's true. That's true. I feel like that could be a critical thing in terms of getting celebrities on board or if somehow you can make the customer not scared of change and giving yes. this power that you, you don't have to be scared of it. If you don't want it, you don't have to wear it. They, they really have an open mind in terms of listening to you. Yes, you know, it's again, it's like the smartphone. Apple could not even give the smartphone away. People would, didn't want them. They wanted the Blackberry. They wanted the big buttons. They wanted to press on the button. If there was a, a, a piece of glass, they thought they were, they were taking advantage with the smartphone at the beginning. They think it was an inferior product. And then one day there was one, two, three enough people to, to, for people to want to follow. So it created a bandwagon effect. So here's the same thing. It's like, who wants to wear the grounded shoes? One thing about the grounded shoes as they've been made is they're not attractive looking type of shoes. So obviously that would be one solution is to, for a brand to take this shoe would be a brand that is known for the, the quality of their design, I suppose. Um, but there's other opportunities that they need to look at. And, you know, I don't want the students to, to jump to a, a scenario, which is, hey, we'll give it to Nike and Nike is going to get their all NBA to wear that shoe and then it's successful. I mean, that's too easy, right? It, that's true. Yeah, it's too easy. So they need to think a little bit harder than the obvious, hey, let's get Nike to give it to all the NBAs. Well, that for sure would work. And then you have, imagine in the Super Bowl, you have like uh, 10 Super Bowl ads. I mean, that's going to be the, the coup de grace, you know, the, the final touch. But think more of the, what is the right scenario for that innovation, for the right context within the right movement? So they have to find the other opportunities that are sort of in this environment maybe having to do with technology, maybe having to do with fashion, maybe having to do with a culture element, some other opportunities to sustain it. So they still have to find some opportunities, but at least they've got the big one. And then they have to find satellite opportunity to support it. Yeah, the design of the shoe could be a critical thing as well. Oh yeah, yeah. It can well, do everything. So anyone, do you have an, another few minutes? Um, yeah, sure. Two to three minutes, if that's Two, okay. three minutes. Yeah. So do you have any questions for Arash? Yeah, Professor, I do, if no one wants to go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Arash, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Question for you. So I know this, this is going to be um, a loaded question. Um, it's actually two in one. How big was your group and how exactly did you guys start? What, what was your starting point? Our group, I think we had five people, five or six people. I mean, the group for the class, um, not the internship during the summer, but yeah. for the class, it was five or six people. And we started by just meeting up one day, creating a group chat, shared docs, and defining roles and due dates. That was basically it. And just checking up on each other as we went on. Little by little, things will fall into their place. But just meeting up, getting to know each other, just um, having a group chat, keeping it active. I think that's, that, that's where you start. Easy start. I love easy starts. Awesome. I think they develop people's motivation much further than meeting up on the first day and trying to do 10 pages of report. Right. And one last question. How, um, how soon did you guys actually have a, the finished product? So let's just say, for instance, ours is due December 12th, I believe, um, Professor. Yes, I think so. And um, so how soon did you have it completed where, you know, you guys can put the finishing touches on the final product? I don't remember exactly, but for you guys, I would recommend being done sometime like maybe December 4th, December 5th. So you can get a fast feedback on it from each other and from a professor and do some finishing touches, maybe two to three days before submitting the assignment. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Of course, yeah. Um, Professor, is it okay if I put my LinkedIn here? They can message me if any questions. Yes, of course. You should. Well, not only that, but, you know, thank you for coming today. And you should put it in your resume, you know, like you're our guest speaker at, uh, at a marketing class. Everything you should, you should take advantage of. I know that's what you're doing. And it's interesting for the students to know your major is a finance major, right? Yes, so, I'm a financial analysis minor in entrepreneurship. Minor in entrepreneurship. And so I hope that you were inspired by your marketing classes and, uh, and that you're going to use it. Like this lady that, who made a gift just before the, the weekend. 
you know so it's wonderful thank you arash thank you thank so you much thank you everyone if you guys have any questions you guys can message me on linkedin have a good one thank you professor thank you bye bye arash thank you for sharing really good thank you for umberto for asking me questions um i keep quite a, a, a lot of relationship with students from the past encouraging them and you know i i, I really enjoy my job so it's not uh, anything uh, that I don't like to do. I love doing that. And so it was interesting to see how he evolved uh, through the time. And now he's, he's doing entrepreneurship as a minor and, and um, great story. So I wish you uh, the same uh, success and hope to inspire you by bringing uh, the guest speaker last week and Arash um, today. So your project is very much an investment that you're doing for yourself. Um, because the uh, if you came out earlier this class, I was just finishing a meeting with another class, which was a student from last semester as well, that was telling me that he liked the fact that he was working on a project. Don't see it too much like it is a student project. It's a group project, but very much an opportunity for you to learn how to work on this project and the um, the exercise, the intellectual exercise. And again, you know, this lady. Uh, from 94 is saying the same thing. There is an intellectual exercise that consists in being curious, in looking for information, in collecting information, and then researching the, um, the solution. So it's constantly having this mind, which is problem, solution, problem, solution, and so forth. So I, uh, will look, I look forward to see your report. I know that you have uh, posted your report before the class. Um, the objective for me and Eric is to review this report as soon as possible today, and then um, to return them to you, I hope, um, by next class. So that's what we're gonna try to focus on, all right? Do you have any questions? Okay, so why do you go to university? What do you learn at the university? Do you learn at the university some information that has to do with your minor. But the big thing is to learn your strengths and your weaknesses. So it's this thing about, yeah, at the university, you learn a, a subject, but I think what you learn the most is you learn how to learn. I think that's the most important thing, is you learn um, about becoming, you know, it's, so it's, it's about doing, it's more important about becoming, and about learning about yourself, learning about your sort of preparing yourself for the future, but the future will be different. And therefore learning how to learn is the most important thing. So the main activities in business, I believe is to understand who are the customers. So that's STP, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Every project is about who are we selling to? What do they want? Let's give the people what the people want. And, and so that, that could also be the definition of, of marketing is learning um, and you know, is giving the people what the people want. I've never seen it being the definition, but I think that's acceptable. And so the opportunities, what are the opportunities? The opportunities are the changes in the market that you can take advantage of. The opportunities, as Arash just mentioned, are not your strengths, your weaknesses, or your threats. You don't want to confuse it with that. They are not your ideas, because your ideas can be tactical or strategic. So therefore, the ideas is what you're going to do. The opportunities are the changes, the, the, the situation, the facts, the real facts, the, um, the genuine um, uh, trends that you can seize you seize the opportunities then the just noticeable difference is what you gonna what change you're gonna make to be noticed if it's too big of a change people are like arash said afraid of changes if it's not enough of a change it's not substantial enough for them to want to take your product so you have to have this balance of enough change so that people see it as a benefit and it's it's what they want it's the perfect match to what they want and it's not overwhelming 
So I put the, on the side uh, research because research is it's like the pillar that is supporting STP. How is it supporting STP? Because you're supporting the fact that you have to understand the customers, who are the customers and the differences. It's supporting the fact that you have to identify those changes that you can take advantage of. And then it's supporting the fact that you're gonna have to develop a plan which highlights the elements that are in these changes and highlights how much change and what specifically you're gonna change and the, normally the, the first thing that you think about the changes are the products, which is what I'm gonna talk about today because today we're gonna to start talking about the four Ps, okay? So to succeed is you need to innovate. To innovate, you have to learn to adapt to the changes. And the best innovation usually comes from understanding the customers and having a view on the customers, which is S, T, and P. What are the characteristics? Who are the customers? That's T. And then what is the image? What is the meaning of your brand for the customers? Selling yourself is very important. Presenting yourself and having leadership skills, but always thinking about research as be not being a bad word. Research is a good word. Research is what's gonna help you make the best decision. So you don't want to think that every problem is solved by a questionnaire, a survey. Survey actually don't solve a lot of problems. Um, a survey is like a very precise tool to evaluate a problem. So before you become precise, you have to be very broad. And the broad way to look at problems is by doing qualitative research, which is to have interviews and speak to people directly. There you can solve big problems and then more specifically you can focus on these um, the answer to specific problems by doing a survey quantitative research so not everything is answered by a survey just remember that so where are we now we're going to look at the product mix which is part of the marketing mix what are the four p's and what is the marketing mix is the exact same question the marketing mix is product, place, promotion, and price. And the four Ps are each one of those P, one of the four Ps. So I think you know this by now. So today we're gonna to start with the product mix. So the product mix are the uh, characteristics of the product that you're gonna sell, the image and the brand that you're gonna sell, the warranty, the packaging, the labeling, the instructions, the different um, colors, different sizes, the service that you may offer after you sell, and maybe the store and the image of the store where people will be buying this product if this product is actually a service. So we'll see there's a difference, um, which is that what is a product? A product is a generic term. So everything that we sell are products, but that's too generic. What do you sell specifically? You sell a good, you sell a service, you sell an organization, an ideas, people, and location. What I mean is that a product is anything offered for someone to acquire. It's therefore the generic term. So is CSUN a product? Yes, CSUN is a product, but it's more specifically an organization but it's also a service. What is the service? The service is education, okay? What are um, uh, holiday destinations? They are places. What are these products? So people are products. A sports person, a politician, an actor, a singer is also a product being that can be marketed so in los angeles it's more common than other cities that you market people because there is a lot of the entertainment done in the city so harley davidson is this a product yes harley davidson is a product but more specifically it's a good what about the olympic games well the olympic games is 
is a, an event. It can be an, an, a location, a, a place. It can also be an organization. What about this? Mother against drunk driving. Mother against drunk driving is an ID. Okay. And so um, what is a service? A service is a product. So it's a type of product which consists of activities, benefits or satisfaction offered for sale, which are essentially intangible. So um, a concert is a service. An hotel is a service. A haircut is a service. A repair, someone repairs your uh, fridge is a service. Someone transports you like a Delta Airlines is a service. Also FedEx is a service. They will be moving your goods. So if you look at services, there's actually more services than goods. And it's a, it's, um, a larger um, revenue than actually goods services are. Because there is a continuum between something that is a 100% a service and something that is 100% a good. There are things that are 50-50, and there are things that are 80% services and 20% and goods. They just vary, like a restaurant. A restaurant is a good and a service, but it's mostly a service more than a good. Maybe you could say 55% a service and 45% a good. Um, if you, uh, a car dealership is a good and a service, they do both. So there's a continuum with more things being service or more things being goods. So do you have any questions or comments? No, so looking at the characteristics of services is you have the first characteristic, which is that you cannot physically touch a service. It's intangible, which means that you cannot replicate a service. It's valuable. It depends on who is providing it. It's inseparable in the sense that there's someone providing the service and you cannot say, I don't want the service. Well, I want the service, but I don't want it to be anyone providing the service. It's a person that is directly producing it at the same time as it's consumed. And that's the characteristic of perishability, means that you cannot create a stock or an inventory of services. They are consumed at the same time as they are produced. So you go to the doctor, I mean, you could, I guess, film the whole um, uh, consultation with the doctor, and that would be sort of the tangible uh, part of the service, but still the service has been rendered and consumed at the same time. So sometimes services are very connected between the person receiving it and the person giving it, which um, create a differentiation between services. Some services are high contact and some are low contact. Uh, because services are also produced by machines. Obviously, the fastest growing um, type of services are the one where there is less human uh, being uh, performing the services. And with um, artificial intelligence, now we see that uh, this trend is going uh, in that direction where less and less people are involved in services. What is SurfQual? So SurfQual is a scale that is provided in order to measure the satisfaction that people have with services. People are more or less satisfied with service. How do you measure satisfaction of a service is by, by using a survey. And the sur most common famous survey is called SurfQual. So, to measure service quality, um, you think about the elements of pricing. 
So people change their perception or their usage based on how much they, they uh, pay. But also the fact that it was before convenient, they could get it 24 seven. Now it's certain times, then they start switching. Maybe because the, the main reason why they were using the service, let's say the service was quick, now it became slow and therefore there's no reason for using that service. So that the, the failure of um, performing and satisfying the customer. The, but not only that is the service provider not acknowledging the fact that they failed is another reason why someone decides to go get uh, the same service from someone else because there's more competitors that's going to create some propensity for consumers to switch but maybe maybe also because they feel that this uh, organization that's providing the service may be um, not uh, environmentally uh, reasonable maybe they don't recycle or maybe because they pollute or maybe because they treat their uh, staff in a way that it's seen as not being fair or simply because people want to try something different and therefore they just switch. So um, to, what's important to see is there's sometimes a responsibility for satisfaction or failure due to the involvement of the customers in the production of the service. So it's important to make customers realize that they are part of the relationship and their, that the quality of that relationship uh, tremendously enhance the quality of the service that you're providing. Um, uh, anyone has a personal experience on how they were involved and as they were involved, it improved the service versus not being involved, it decreased the service. Yeah, I have one, Professor. Yes, go ahead. So, um, you're talking about like just improving like service in general, right? To, in order for them to not leave like unsatisfied? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, one time uh, at a job that I had, um, basically they ordered like close to $200 worth of food. Yes. And basically it was like tacos or something, right? And they didn't realize that it didn't come with the actual tor uh, tortillas. It just yes. like the meat. It was just the meat. So basically it was for 25 people and uh, they were a little bit dissatisfied and they're, you know, yes. and basically she was going to disappoint her entire family and like all her friends. So they were really busy and stuff. And uh, me, I, I had to go talk to the manager and stuff like that. And they really weren't listening to me because they were busy. So yes. they kind of just gave her whatever. And then just so, you know, so she can kind of leave. And I felt that, you know, that's really, it, it kind of hurt me. I was like, wow, that sucks, you know? So I basically told her, hey, you know, go ahead, go ahead and take like a couple of the, it was like small tortillas. Um, it was like two, it was like basically like 10 bucks. And I was like, come on, like we can at least do that. You know, they yeah. spent almost dollars. And I think that probably made a lot better sense than just giving her like something that completely irrelevant to what she wanted. So like, yeah, I just wanted to satisfy her at least slightly in order for her not like to come back and stuff like that, you know? Yes, of course. So in your situation, it's, it's the response to a, ser a service failure. Right. You know, it's a little bit, you know, the example oftentimes I hear is you go to the hotel and there's, your room is not ready. And mm -hmm. then they give you a, a free coffee or something like this while you're waiting. Or mm -hmm. at least they keep your luggage. They give you the, the, the keys to go to the pool or something like that. So that way it's not a, a, a total failure. And I think that is very important. What businesses don't realize is that if you fail, you pretty much lose this customer. But if right. you do something you know, to, to, to show that you are sympathetic, you know, compassionate, and that you're re genuinely sorry. Therefore, they don't think it's something that you do all the time. And also the problem with services is when people don't feel that they are an individual, that they are treating as a number. And therefore, if there's not a personal touch, that's what happens as well. You know, like you fail, 
but I didn't mean it. And mm-hmm. I can prove that because that you did is you give, you know, some extra product in order to compensate. Often, right. You know, just you know, like to make tacos, you know, <laughs> how are you going to have meat without the, without the tortillas? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, you can like, <laughs> so, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, that's also, a good example. Yes. Also, Professor, I agree with that because I'm in the, I work in uh, hospitality at the moment. Yes. And um, what I realized is that you have to make every guest feel like they're like the most important ones, you know? So like you're saying, like, if the room's not ready, um, if they come early, yeah. then, you know, we try to offer them like the pool keys. We tell them if you want to grab some appetizers on us. So it's a big thing, I feel like, in the hospitality as well. Yes, you have to. And so the, the reason is because people are likely to, to come back many more times and spend more and tell their friends. And obviously now because of the impact of online rating and so forth, these businesses may do it because it's good business, but they may also do it because um, they realize that they, they're losing uh, a customers which is not worth what they're spending today but what they're going to spend for the next 10 years and Correct. they may give feedback that's going to damage the reputation of the of the service provider and as well as also like you're saying um for example like a hotel industry or a car industry the market is so big and people have so many different options to choose from yeah that you need to find a way to stand out that's why i feel like also um marketing in general as you were saying before is very very important because for example i work at the marriott and there's so many different hotel within the marriott organization as well as obviously hilton and hyatt's all these competitions so um it's very i feel like it's very big on what you're saying so yes yeah yeah it's very important so there's very um it's kind of amazing because there's still a lot of managers that do this, um, this relationship. They don't build a relationship with the customers. It's, a, it's almost like a one-time uh, exchange. And they don't realize that it's in service, it's so personal that you have to cultivate. And so this particular slide here is this idea that since customers are participating, they will uh, they will appreciate much better. So uh, that, it's funny, it reminds me um, um, a situation I had. I had a fridge that was not working in my house. And I was v- v- quite upset. But for some reason, my wife was even more upset than me. And so the people who came to uh, repair it, when they came, they didn't fix it the first time. But I was there when they tried to do it. And I could see that they tried. I even uh, gave them a hand to try to, to do a number of things. And then I could see myself that the reason why they couldn't fix it that one day it was supposed to be done in one day. And so right. we had to wait a little bit uh, for a while for the fridge to be fixed. I was okay with it because I was the witness of them giving their best effort and even myself trying to, to help versus my, my wife was not there. And she really thought that, we, that nobody did what they were supposed to because she did not witness, she did not collaborate, she did not participate. So it's nothing wrong with her. I think most people would have felt that way. When you don't participate in a service, you, um, you're most likely to, to complain. And when you participate, you can better understand what is going on. So a little bit like this, the, the same, um, you see what I'm doing right now is a service and the more the students participate, the, 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 the better for them because they can ask their questions. I don't know what are their questions. I can't guess what are their questions. If they ask their questions, I can see what are their questions. The fact that they ask questions, uh, I feel better about discussing subjects because I feel that they are more interested. So there is an effect, there's a feeding effect, is the people receiving the service, if they are they show interest, if they participate, they are most of the time more satisfied than the people that don't participate. So when you have a business with a service, 
and you know that people participation is going to increase their satisfaction, is it to your advantage to uh, solicit their participation or engage their participation? So that's very interesting. So there's, with services, there's a lot of human uh, behavior to, that needs to be understand, understood because it's not like you're making a product and once you have the formula, like the architecture of the product, you can just replicate this architecture and just make sure it's available for consumers. And then you just observe um, people's usage of the product and see what you can you could do to make it better. With services, there's more characteristics being involved. There's more variation. So that's therefore what's interesting to look at. So now with the fact that consumers are sometimes forced, but they may not even, even realize that they're forced to get involved in the service, such as the use of their phone to make transaction. Or maybe they just go to a, a retail store and now they have to, they decide that they want to scan the product themselves. And then they go through the, some, through the check uh, counter by themselves, by scanning everything, by bagging everything, by punching the credit card things and doing everything themselves until they get the receipt. That is the, the difference than receiving the service and being involved in the service. It's even possible, and I think it happened to me, that I would go to a place like Home Depot and I would prefer to use the um, self-serve uh, checkout because I feel like it's faster. But when I um, go there and there's nobody uh, in the line where there's someone, that's gonna help me, I prefer to be helped by someone because that way someone is taking care of it. And for some reason now, I appreciate the fact when someone can take care of it because everything is turning into be more and more machines. And sometimes it's nice to see that it's not a machine, but it's actually someone there. And sometimes you have a little trouble. There's something that doesn't work as expected. And it's nice to have someone because they can uh, troubleshoot it much faster. So. Technology is uh, changing the world uh, when it comes to services more than any other of the other products. And it allows therefore to sort of customize, personalize, individualize how people receive the services. But in some way, it's uh, removed some of the human touch uh, components. So you have to think about this. Any other comments that you may have when it comes to services, some experiences, or maybe what you prefer when it's um, dealing with a machine or dealing with a human being, what are your perspectives? Yes, go ahead, Trevor. Uh, I was gonna say, sometimes with the technology, a lot of times it's not fleshed out and it can be pretty annoying at a restaurant when you have to deal with like online menus and phone apps and stuff that don't work very well. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, we all have oftentimes uh, our favorite restaurant and I remember going to my favorite restaurants. And then one day they decided that the menu had to be on some kind of uh, uh, tablet. And so they handed me a tablet and then I looked in the tablet. And it's funny because I ordered different than when I had the paper menu. When I had the paper menu, I would order a certain number of products that I liked and I was familiar. And then when they gave me the tablet, the information was presented in a different way. I ended up ordering something different. So I guess that was good. I discovered some of the things that I would have not sort of looked at inside the menu. But on the other hand, for some reason, I felt like it was more limited in the tablet, which I'm not saying it's always more limited than the tablet, but that's how I felt. Because there was lots of pictures um, and it was good to see these pictures, but then I couldn't see all the variety and the organi organization was different. So I felt this was, this was um, different. And then there was the pandemic as well, where you would go and the tablet was, the, was gone and then you had to use your phone. And then that was a different way again to order. And, and then I ordered food in a different way than it was when it was the paper and when it was the tablet. And, um, but overall, I guess because I was used to the paper, I, I was not as satisfied as, uh, as the paper. Um, I felt like I was working, you know? It's like, yeah. Yeah. It, feels, yeah, it feels inconvenient. And sometimes they don't have everything on the tablets, like you said, it can be a little awkward. Yeah, sometimes, I guess it's not just me, but everybody was feeling, where is everything? And, uh, but you know, we, 
we use those um, those those formats all day. I mean, most of us we are we use the computer all the time. We use the phone all the time. Then you go to the restaurants and you want to have more of a human uh, touch. And now here's to give you another computer that you have to deal with. And I just found that this was more of a, uh, supposedly an upgrade that to me was a, a downgrade. And it's funny because I discovered that, that that's because I, one thing that I deal with a, a lot is the luxury consumption world, because that's my specialty. Um, I discovered that this, the, the top hotels are actually removing the use of um, smart cards uh, to go to your room. You know, the, the cards that, like a credit card that you have to slide um, through the door in order to get access. The very high-end hotels are giving people keys again uh, to go to their, uh, to their um, room. And what they, why are they doing that? Is because they found that people, when they have a key, they feel like they, this is more special. They're getting somewhere special versus when they have a card that they're going to dispose. It's, I guess, it's maybe better from a security point of view. But, but on the other hand, it sort of loses the human touch of having a key. So those hotels, uh, purposely, are making very nice keys and big keys with big locks and all that for people when they go to their room, they find that this is like a substantial um, way, uh, or like a traditional way to get in. And it sort of connects well with the fact that they're spending a lot of money for those rooms. So, you know, it, bringing technology, it's sort of the, the, what everybody feels is the right thing to do as if there's no other alternatives. Obviously, you have to think about the pros and the cons of the technology. And oftentimes, there's more pros and cons, but it can't be systematic. It cannot be that more technology brings more satisfaction. So understanding customer satisfaction is very important for goods, for organization, for events, for ideas, and for services. Any other comments? So the product that you're working on this semester is definitely a good. It's a pair of shoes. And uh, you're selling a, uh, a pair of shoes with some kind of characteristics that allow the, allow the user uh, to gain some health benefits. The services, products, goods, ideas, and so forth are broken down into three layers. Um, I believe in the sample that I sent you last week, uh, I, there is actually a mention of those three layers. I thought this was interesting to see how they, that can be used. So they are inside the, um, the sample report that I emailed, um, the last one I emailed that was last week. And inside it talks about the core, actual and augmented product benefits. So the core benefit is the main benefit that you uh, use in order to buy a product. So this main benefit will be for a shoe, um, I guess would be, um, what would be the main, the main benefit for buying a shoe? To protect your feet. Yes, protect your feet. You know, protect from the cold, protect from the, the ground, being hurt from, by something and maybe you could say, okay, comfort as well. So that's the core benefit, maybe for sure, comfort. What are the actual product benefits for a shoe? So the different quality level, the different brand names, the different um, features of this product. So for a shoe, is you would have the fact that they use leather or no leather, that they have different way of being tied. Um, the, the, the grounded shoe, so why would someone buy the grounded shoe? I think the core benefit will be probably be the health benefit the actual product benefit um, 
well, you have to think about that. You know, depending on the brand that you select, depending on the, the features and designs and the different options that the shoe could have, then you would have all of these as an actual. Then the augmented benefit. So the augmented benefit might be from the convenience of, uh, uh, of trying the product, the, um, the elements that have to do with um, the purchasing this product. Maybe there is installments to buy the product. Maybe there is some kind of warranty that comes with the shoe. So in the case of the grounded shoe, I don't think you would want to give a warranty for the health benefits. Obviously, you would want to not do that. You may want to give a warranty for the, the main uh, core benefit, which is the fact that your feet will be grounded. So um, maybe what happens is because it used this metal piece and the metal piece eventually will get used. So maybe there's after sale services to offer extra um, metal piece to uh, replace in your shoe in order to keep getting the benefit. All right, so these are the three layers. So now if we look at a thread mill as the core benefit is to be safe at home and exercise, there will be different brands there will be different level of quality with the different features of having different inclination, different speeds, different memories. Um, and then there will be different packaging. There will be the, the possibility of folding the thread mill and uh, different uh, size of folding. So folding to a, a half of the size, folding that becomes a quarter of the size and fo folding that becomes a 10, times smaller than the original size. Um, the augmented product benefit will be the fact that you can order it and get it fast. You could pay um, in different times, in different installments, and then there will be a, a long warranty. Okay. Do you have any questions? I think, let me check. I think there's no questions. Professor, I'm so yes. sorry. No, so no. so this these granite shoes, you said um only six companies, startup companies are using it. Is that is that correct or no? Well, I don't know if the number is six. Um I was I have not done the research myself. I will be much more knowledgeable after I read, you know, there's gonna be something like 31, 32 reports. Mm -hmm. Um it seems that there's not too many because it's so new that even me i'm trying to wrap my head around i've never worn one or seen one so yes. i'm just trying to is it like a coil on the bottom of the shoe almost like it gives you a certain feel yeah like a metal. yeah so okay. the, sh the shoe is a coil yeah as a as a well there's several style now there is at least six companies and all of these companies don't use the exact same design in order to get the earthing benefit or the grounded benefit. Some are more basic where there is a wire that goes under your feet and under the sole. So that way your feet is in contact on the sole is. And this tends to be the more um, basic. Then there's some other one company actually that sells the accessory. Oh, wow. You know, and so they sell the accessory itself. So they are not in the business of selling grounded shoes. They're in the business of selling the accessory that will make most shoes grounded. Wow. And, and does that give you a certain feel or is it actually like it lessens the, like I'm trying to get a sense of like what the metal part does to your foot. Like, does it make you feel better or does it like, protect your feet or give you no they no 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 but this has to do with the with the earth you see the earthing 
uh, movement mm -hmm. oh, is, okay, okay. is the, 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 the big overall opportunity. More for the earth than like more uh, no, the green. Earth, and no, 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 no. The earthing movement is not this. You, you, you need to, I mean, to do some research right, right. on this. So the earthing movement is a movement which has to do with uh, the, the health benefit of people to be physically directly in contact with earth in order to get the benefits of earth. Mm. You know, a little bit like saying eating fruits versus eating dry fruits versus eating powder fruit. Yeah. If, you, if, you take, if you buy some powder, which is supposed to be all kinds of fruit, yeah. it's not the same benefit as a bunch of dry fruits, which is not the same benefit as just grabbing an apple from a tree and eating it five seconds after you, you, picked, you picked it up. So there's a disconnect when you eat the powder. It's industrialized and all this. So these people, they say that people have to eventually, for all kinds of health benefits, be grounded, touch the ground. But we live in an environment where this has disappeared. People live in an apartment on the first ground. People wear shoes. People sleep in a mattress, which mattress is inside a bed frame. So we are like losing the, uh, the touch of being on the ground, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I remember when I was a kid, the question, it's not, not me, when I had a baby, toddlers, as parents, you want your kids to walk as fast as possible because you figure if they don't walk, there's something wrong with them. So that's every parent. I mean, I can, I can easily say 99.9%. Is when you have a, uh, a little infant, there's going to be a toddler and it's going to walk. You want them to go walk as fast as possible. Now, the research shows that if they go from being on their, on their butt and walking too fast, they're missing the dev developmental part of being on their knees and crawling. So you don't want them to crawl for a year because they're not supposed to crawl for a year. That's too long. But not crawling at all, apparently there's people that have psychological problem that you discover when they are 30, 40, 50 years old, is because they didn't crawl enough. <laughs> so then you go, wow, that's kind of crazy because most of every parent, what they want to do is they want to see their daughter and their son walk as quickly. It's like, you're one years old. At one years old, you got to walk. If you're not walking at one years old, you're crazy. When in fact, it's possible that they walk later but what's very important is that they go through the stages. So the crawling stage, which is, you know, the very short in your life, you only crawl some, some people for a few weeks, some people for a few months, very short. If you bypass it, you bypass some child psychological developments, which are kind of weird, but that, that they need. So then these people that believe in all these kind of things, that everything cannot be explained, believe in the concept that people were made and created and for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years to, to be in regular, if not constant, connection with Earth. So it's like an electrical thing, if you want. And so that's the earthing movement. And then from the earthing movement, that gave the idea as a main opportunity to create a bunch of shoes, which are called earthing or grounded shoes, which allow you to wear the same rubber shoes, but at the same time to get the benefit of being in connection with the ground by having this metallic uh, accessory on it. Does that answer your? Yes, that was perfect. Uh, just one last, it would be really quick. Yeah. Just for the shoes, would we only be able to market one shoe or would we, like, let's say we want to do sandals and regular shoes. Can we do that or are we just doing one? You can do several. Okay, okay. But you don't have to. And why do I say, because the more shoe you do, the more work it is. Right. So it's easier to say, we're going to do five shoes. But at the beginning, we start with this one. Mm -hmm. And why that one? Because, so you have to imagine that there's always one first product. There's always one that starts. Sometimes 
it's only for two weeks, you know, that was the first product for two weeks, but there's always a, a start. Just for one city instead of one state, there's always a start. And the bigger the company, the more they, they could have more than one. But at the end of the day, it's, it's better to, even for a big company, to have a plan of, you start with, a, like you make cars, you start with four doors, two doors, convertible, truck, uh, you know, and then they usually start with one and then they roll out the other one and they roll. So it's much better to have a, a perspective, which is a rollout of multiple products but at a different time in order to have some learning between these and usually start with the one that is the most obvious to start with. So in that situation, which, and that's, that's what the question you should have now is which target, which need, what other opportunities beside the health opportunity? Because that's the main opportunity why people will buy grounded shoes. But could it be that there is a shoe, you know, a, a company that would benefit from it? Could it be that there's a brand? I mean, I mean, imagine this. So now we, let's be crazy. Like Arash said, you see a treadmill. Is this treadmill connected to the ground? That's true. This, the, the person running on this treadmill is not connected to the ground. So could, are, are there people, I know there's people that use the treadmill barefoot because it's a different type of exercise. Maybe they don't use it every time barefoot, but that's one of, you know, way of running on treadmill is barefoot. I mean, when you go to 24 seven or LA fitness or whatever, you probably don't do that because it's not your treadmill. But if you own the treadmill, you know, it's possible some people run barefoot. If there was a treadmill that was sort of explaining that you could gain from having the treadmill that is grounded. So there's a grounded shoe and now there's a grounded treadmill. And so you can run on this and get the benefit of being um, grounded. I mean, that's crazy what I'm saying. But <laughs> thank you, Professor. <laughs> but, but I like it. I actually found a, a project for someone if you're interested. <laughs> that's kind of crazy. I think that's one, one you, if you've ever been wondering what the heck was the project about, I think we just run into one as right now. That's kind of, I never thought of that. But there you go. Here's your grounded treadmill. Do you, anyone understand the, what are we talking about? Why is this kind of a, a fluke, coincidental thing? But that's sort of perfect. Imagine someone that runs on a treadmill. Why do they run on a treadmill? What's the core benefit? Stay healthy. Healthy. Size. Yeah, but healthy sports, you know, I mean, you don't want to become, uh, although that's not true because there's a lot of people that go to the gym and they want to become better, bigger, and then they go, I want to become bigger, faster, and then they take products, and then they're going to look bigger, faster, but with the product, they're going to get not so healthy. So some people compromise their health for the look. So not everybody who buys a treadmill is mostly interested in his health. You know, it may be that they're professionally training for something. And as we know, there's some professional trainers that take some drugs in order to do better. So you would not think that they are doing sport just for health. They have other uh, like fame or, uh, you know, financial reasons. So not everybody who runs on a treadmill is for health, but the people that run on a treadmill for health, what are the functions? You can see your heart rate, you can see your calories, you can see all kinds of this and all kinds of that. Imagine if there was the her thing and then you will be earth, maybe not by your feet, but you could be earthed by your hand. Or you could be earthed by something else. Yes, go ahead, Trevor. Uh, wouldn't there be an issue because there's electricity, though, with the treadmill and the grounding? Like, 
be dangerous, I think. Yeah, I don't, uh, um, well, but I, what I think is that the treadmill is is grounded by le the electricity. There's like three pounds on it. See, when you buy it, I actually think you have three pounds, you have two flats on one round. The round is already the electrical ground. Here, it's the isolation from the floor to the person using it. It's even possible that you could, what would be interesting is you, it's to put something going from the ground, from the floor, and then see if it goes in the end or, and if actually a treadmill or some treadmill may already be grounded without people realizing that. But the problem is you could not get it from the feet. You could get it only from the end because you have a rubber thing. So you could only ground from the from your hands, you know. Yeah, maybe it probably wouldn't so, work on feet. That'd be too dangerous, I think. Yeah. Well, also, how can you make the 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 rubber thing? So you would have to have wires on the rubber, even like tiny wires, you know, like the wires you have in your um, back windshield of your car, where you have the defrosting. You can't see there's wire in there. But the problem is you will be running on it. I mean, I guess it's possible to make a, a mesh wire on those rubber thing that would allow you to have, um, to have your feet grounded. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you would have to find out if it's, if it's safe as well, yeah. Yeah, you could kill yourself if you're not careful, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that was, you see, that's what marketing is about, is constantly looking at product improvement in order to come up with an innovation that is um, substantial. The problem here, again, is you can't think, I mean, a grounded treadmill may seem to be a small detail, but you don't know until you ask the consumers. Now everybody is the same. And it's possible that a group of people will go, wow, they never thought of the shoe, but they will learn of that innovation, not from the shoe, but from the, from a treadmill. Okay, so that, just to finish this before the break, is think about the core, the actual, and the augmented products for season. What is the core product benefit? It's higher learning. So yes, learning, the knowledge, the education. The, um, what are the actual benefits? Degree. So yes, the degree, the major. Learning how to learn. Y yeah. I job. Think that's, yeah, the, so job, uh, what do you mean by job? Um, you're able to get a job by completing an education. Or your degree. So maybe that's the core benefit is to get a job, I guess. But the, the core benefit is you go to the university <coughs> that will get, uh, but you see, that's a, actually, that's a good one is people think they're going to go to the university and it's the, the society owns them a job and then they come out, they graduate. And then they find that nobody's waiting for them. People may go to university thinking they're going to get a job, but that doesn't get you a job. A job is still something that you, that you have to earn for trying, for doing something. The world doesn't come at you the minute you're graduated. Um, the world doesn't change. And so there's no right or wrong of what's the core and what's the actual. It's very individual. We can only sort of generalize. And, and generally, people go to the university to get knowledge. Generally, people go to the university as an actual to get a degree, to get a major, to get to a specific class that they will wanted to study, to get to a specific professor. And then the augmented, that's why I ask you that, is the augmented maybe the services that you may get at the university, like career placement. So the career placement, the internship, so that's, you see, these are also to get a job, but they are like 
augmented benefits, which is that the university will offer some uh, alumni events and uh, meetings and, and mentoring and, and career placement. And that's going to help you get a job. Um, the university will offer maybe some uh, health and doctor and nursing help, some sports facilities, some food facilities, some connection with the bank to get some loans for uh, doing things after and during. So all of these are the augmented. You don't go to university, so that way you can have access to the library or to the cafeteria. You go to the university first, the core being the education, and then actual being the different classes and degree, and then the cafeteria is the type of consumer products. So um, there's four categories of consumer products. There's convenience, shopping, specialty, and unsought. The convenience product is the one that people buy regularly and uh, often there is uh, not much thinking and processing. They tend to be lower priced. Uh, there is mass production, mass uh, consumption, mass advertising of these products. They are sold in uh, mass distribution to so available pretty much everywhere and uh, so example is um, soap um, uh, candy meat eggs so these are the convenience products that you buy all the time the next group are the shopping products so in that that's very different it's a much smaller group than the convenience if you don't buy them often they are high, uh, more expensive there are uh, fewer places where you can buy them from. People make comparison between these uh, shopping products. So it's not like, like for the um, convenience where they're going to just look for the, um, the product where the brand has less importance. In the shopping pro products, the brand is important and therefore they're making comparison. They may um, study, uh, talk to other people, um, compare and so forth. So the fashion goods, the uh, uh, buying a car, buying some home appliances, these will be shopping products. Then the specialty products are even more uh, special in the sense that people will put a lot of effort in uh, searching the one that is the most appropriate. There will be high prices, um, they are sort of like luxury uh, category of product, but not, it's not just luxury, it's, it could be premium. And again, it depends on, on people's revenue, uh, the perspective of that specialty product, but they tend to be more unique brands, special brands uh, with per very distinct characteristics of the product. You can't buy them everywhere. And so, you know, buying, uh, luxury furniture or buying um, jewelry and all that uh, expensive watches and, and expensive cars these will be considered a specialty now the last one is the unsought which that one is not as obvious and as the other one because the unsought products are the one that you don't think of for several reasons one is because you are not the target of this product. So, uh, if you if it's a you know like a specific product that would tend to be made more for women, or tend to be made more for men, or tends to be made more for kids versus adults, uh, will be considered unsold products because they are not targeted. Or product that you have, um, you know, a product sold for people who have a disability. Uh, people that do not have that disability are not going to be thinking of this product, so it's unsought. And a product that are very connected to a culture, and therefore they will not be sought uh, but for another culture. So, um, uh, you know, kosher food. Kosher food uh, may not be something that someone who's not interested in getting things that are 
um, kosher won't make any any sense. Um, and so something you can't think. The other thing is it's maybe something has to do with a specific uh, situation, you know, being married. Um, I mean, like a, a wedding gown is not something that you think of if you're not planning to be married or far from being married, you don't think of a wedding gown. But then there's the further down this road, there is just all of these products people don't think of because there's so many things that people can consume and they don't think about it. They think of soap, they think of egg, they think of water because these are the convenience, the more universal type of products. But they may not be thinking about something that is very specific to what um, your company is making. They may not think about it because it's not usual or they may not think about it just because they just don't know that it exists. Now, with the product that we're working on this semester, that what is that? Is that a convenience, a shopping, a specialty, or an unsought? Would it fall under unsought, Professor? So yes, the ground that shoes are definitely, I would say for most people, they are unsought. Obviously, they may not be unsought for the people that buy them, right? But for most consumers, they are unsought. So if we had to define it, is we'd say it's an unsought product. For the people that know about this product, it's likely to be either a specialty or a shopping product. When would it be a shopping product? I guess when it's, it's sought after. <laughs> Well, it would be a shopping product, maybe not. When let's say they bought, they already bought, started buying them since 2016, and they buy about three or four pairs a year, and or maybe one or two pairs a year, and they're just gonna gonna buy another pair of um, grounded shoes. So it becomes a specialty. They just know that they have to buy another one. And they know the different brands. They like two or three of those seven brands that exist. And it's just uh, something that is more expensive. They know something that's not everywhere. They know, right? But someone that knows, like, like the class, the people in the class. I think for most people, this would be a specialty. You know, we have 160 students. I would say for, there's probably 155 students that this is a specialty. Um, if there is 30 students that buy this product this year in 2021, and then someone buys it again in May, 2022, I would say in, in September, 2022, it's gonna be maybe it's becoming a special shopping product and not a special specialty anymore, unless they're de deciding to buy one that is more unique, that has more characteristics, that is even more expensive. And then that would become, you know, like a, a Louis Vuitton uh, grounded shoe. That would be a specialty. So it's not unsought, it's not shopping, it becomes a specialty. So the same product can be in, in various characteristics, depending who you're talking to. It's just that if we do an overall definition of that shoe right now, it's unsought. I would, uh, like you, you just mentioned, I think it was Umberto that you just stated. It would be unsought. Yes, sir. For the most part. And so what is the dilemma that we're working on the semester? It's how can we make this unsought product become a shopping product? If I told you this is the, the, the title of your project at the beginning of the semester, you would have gone, whoa, what is going on? So now it makes more sense. That's really the, the big number one problem is it should not be an unsought. It should become more a shopping. And how do you make it become more a shopping is by gaining it associated with a brand, which may not be in shoes, which has to do with the target that you think is the perfect target to want to buy the shoe. Perfect target to want to buy the shoe are people that care about uh, health and in particular, about health 
that has nothing to do with, um, you know, like medical science type of thing, or at least medical science from a, a very um, biochemical perspective. So someone that believes in science, and I have someone in my family, I don't want to say who it is, because it's kind of bad, but someone in my family who is a very famous doctor and also a professor of medicine and a very successful professor of medicine who has a specialty of biochemical medical um, uh, teaching. This, per this person really believes that every medical problem can be solved by a, <clears throat> a, a molecule, um, by taking medicine. And so, this person will be so hard to convince that there is a shoe that you're going to wear that's going to medically help you. I mean, it's, it's, it makes me laugh just thinking about it. It's a never ending debate. <clears throat> so for this person, it's unsought and it's never going to be desirable. It's like a joke for this person. But there are, pe are people that are on the opposite and maybe too much on the opposite, that they are even scared of menace of the medicine which is using pills and things like that <clears throat> and these people they exist and i would not be surprised that they are sort of coming out uh, more uh, from this um, situation of covid where they are, are becoming more uh, bipolar in a way right and so this shoe really appeals very much to a group of people that that will love to know that you can take a, eat a food a certain food <clears throat> and be healthier eat a certain food and be younger eat a certain food and have more testosterone eat a certain food and think that you're stronger eat a certain food and think that you're going to be faster more intelligent study uh, less tired all this thing uh, eat a certain oil, a certain plant, a certain a flower, a certain herb, and make, that would make you healthier. These people exist. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not making a judgment. I'm just telling you that there is people that think that they can uh, go to uh, some kind of place and get a tea or get a, uh, a juice. They're going to go to get a juice, and that juice is going to detoxify them. It's a detox pill. It's a detox juice. It's a detox position. And the people that believe in detox position will absolutely love a shoe that's doing a detox uh, while they're, they're sitting somewhere or walking somewhere, and they are detoxifying themselves from wearing that shoe. True or not true, that's a different subject. Um, and they may be right, the people that think that. And therefore, um, that's what's interesting in life is there's different point of view. And the marketer is essentially, the job is to understand this different point of view and then offer a product that serves and satisfy the people with their point of view. But what's the problem is there's a lot of people that believe in the detox juice, yet they don't know about the detox shoes, if you want, right? And that's what we need to work on. Because someone before, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't totally pick the name, was telling me what, what are the grounded shoes do. I think maybe you, I found the summary finally. It's like a detox. Anyone has, has a comment on that? What, what does the shoe do? What really is this, the summary of your interpretation of what does the shoe do? Um, I learned about grounding and earthing all the way back in high school. And I think okay. wow. when I learned about it then, it was about like having excess electrons leaving your body. Um, so in a way, like... Uh, electrons have a negative charge so yes. my science teacher put it in the way that you're literally having the negativity leaving your body and that's yeah. why you feel better afterwards exactly yeah that's but the purpose of that is that the negative 
uh, electrons in your body have a negative impact on on your body, right? Right. So it's like so it's like, a, so it's like toxic. It's like a, maybe you don't have the full immunity that you should have. You don't have the full energy that you should have. You don't have the full clarity that you should have. Your organs are sort of not fully or uh, somewhat affected by this negative energy. Is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, electrons are a type of energy as well as like, I mean, I know here in California, people talk about the energy of people and the vibes of people and stuff like that. So um, what was kind of explained to me was the reason you feel better by putting your hands in the ground when you're gardening or touching your feet to the grass to like let go of negative energy. It's more than just a, you know, oh, I feel their vibe thing. It's like yeah. a, you know, actual thing that's yeah. negative in your body that makes you feel negative. So then when you reconnect with the earth, you leave the negativity balanced between yourself and the earth. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's this balance. Um, how many people, uh, I mean, it's, this is sort of a little bit strange. I'm asking that down the road, but okay, go, go ahead, Umberto, before I comment. Sorry, Professor, I just wanted to yeah. touch on something. I think it was Lexi. Um, yes, it was she, Lexi. What, what she reminded me of right now is, you know how you're walking um, in your socks at home and, and you're walking on the carpet and then you suddenly touch something and there's a discharge. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's kind of what just came to mind when, when she mentioned releasing negative energy. Um, anyway, that's... Yes, that's just and, that, and that's... That is, you know, uh, I think it's, it, it's probably beyond being a medical... Um, doctor or nurse to really understand this because it talks about things that they don't spend a lot of time on and also because it's sort of something that you believe or you don't believe and it's uh, it takes maybe a, a sort of medicine which is not so much western medicine it's maybe more of a spiritual medicine maybe asian indian medicine maybe explain all of these things better i'm just guessing and so it is true that it's happened to me that I, um, I mean, I, I, can, I can replicate it. I have a specific pair of shoes that if I go to my car, I mean, it's not a, it's a, I mean, it's like a, it's like I'm lighting a match. It's not a small spark, it's a massive spark. If I wear that type of shoe and I go to my car and I go around my car, you know, do, I do something and I touch several times my car. The third or fourth time I touch my car, I have a huge flash. And I mean, my crazy. And I know that exact pair of shoes. It doesn't do it with other shoes for some reason. And so um, how did that happen? I mean, this, it's not a, insignificant. It's a big flash. And I've had this before, but I don't know why uh, that, that specific pair of shoes give me this massive flash. And yeah. And for some reason, there's a, some weird stuff. And so I, I was thinking about this myself, like Umberto. And I was thinking, gee, that could be connected to this concept. Um, but I told you I came up, uh, I, I ran across this concept because this was, I think, in 2016, maybe 15 even. The client for the class was a book writer, and she was a psych. psych Catrist, no, no, psychology, sorry. She, was, she had a PhD in psychology and she was uh, specialized in depression and unfortunately suicide. So that's like the extreme end of depression. And so she had all kinds of um, remedy against uh, not getting too depressed. And she had a chapter, chapter on energy. And inside the chapter, she was mentioning to uh, remove your shoes and walk in grass. And I remember that very well because at the back then in 2015, 16, we had classes in class and she, as she was explaining a number of things to the students, she removed their shoes. So you have to imagine we're in a big lecture hall, there's 160 people. So the class is sort of packed. And then this lady, she was a very tall lady came and took to the students her book and we're gonna help her with the book. And then she started, to, kept talking and then suddenly she took their shoes off and she walked around as she was explaining that. 
and all the students were sort of laughing at what she was doing, but laughing in a friendly way. And she says, that's it. I need to release some energy. So I'm just taking my shoes off. And then she kept talking, talking, talking. She puts her shoes back and as if it was nothing. And, um, you know, and I, that sort of went like, oh, why is she taking her shoes? And I, I met with her afterwards and I asked her, oh, what is this thing about the shoes? And she says, it's called her thing. And not right away, maybe a year after. I was, you know, looking at Wikipedia or whatever. And then I thought of this earth thing. I put earth thing and that's how I ran into it. And at that time I said, oh, is, are there anyone selling earth thing shoes? And so I Googled and there was none, zero, not one brand of shoe. So like I said, 2015 or whatever. And I now I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Nobody took that opportunity to make a shoe. I'm sure there's a business for someone to make a shoe on all this. And then I thought of it again um, uh, earlier this year or something. And then I said, I should take this as a student project, but I give them the opportunity this time. And I Googled it and then I found that there were people doing shoes. So by the time people took the opportunity, but then I saw that these shoes were not very appealing. They were not very developed. You could see they were startups, small businesses, not big businesses that jumped on it. And it's pretty common that before a business becomes a mass business that everybody knows about, it started from someone that had a small business, eventually get bought out or eventually struggle with it and they get copied by a bigger company. And when it, then we all know the big company, but not the small company. So I was thinking that would be perfect, but as a reverse way of, instead of saying, find something for a brand, it's you've got the opportunity and then you try to exploit it with the best brand that would be the best match to exploit it, you know, not looking at the financial aspects saying, let's take the biggest brand on earth. And then they, they so big that they can do anything that would be not interesting, but find the best match based on sets of opportunities. So Umberto, you had your hand up again. What was your comment and question? No, uh, no, professor, that, that was my question. I, uh, pardon me if I, okay. I guess I raise it again. Okay, no problem. So any, anyone wants to add something that they, they found being the, 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 the grounded shoes. So it's unsought. That's a huge problem. And it's unsought. The reason behind, so I'm sort of working on your report when I'm saying that, it's because it's not for everybody to believe in uh, getting uh, something medical from something that is not a pill. But people have a lot of trust on this. Here's a pill, here's a, is a, is a solution. And so this is more something that you have to, to believe. So it's unsought because, I, and that's something I'd like to, to learn from reading your report is who are the people that believe in this more? Do you believe more in, as to these things are hard to explain as you get older, is this an age thing? Do you believe more in these things as you are more educated? So which means, you know, like upper classes are more believing in natural medicine. It's, if I had to guess, I would say yes, because I think it takes a level of education, which doesn't have to be a huge level of education, but a level of education that would say that someone who's sort of a, you know, uh, average Joe, just to give you a name like this, may not be so sensitive to. I think those people, they, they burn the candle from both sides and therefore they're not gonna wanna invest their time and money into some kind of health thing and all that. So I'm thinking that that's a specific group of people that has to do with, I don't think they have to be extremely rich or extremely educated, but I think a certain level of education maybe is necessary. Um, what about the people that tends to be, to feel that they are always sick, you know, always weak. People always, I don't know what to say. People that either they have a low immunity and they know, or they just think, they are a danger, a little scared people, scared of 
of disease people. Could these people be uh, happy to have shoes that just, they don't know if it works, but one more thing going in their direction? The hypochondriac, maybe? Hypochondriac, yes. Hypochondriac people. You know, those people that, I, I, I remember that at one time there was people selling uh, wristbands, you know, wristbands or necklaces, necklaces or things they help you with um, with with your health. I remember actually going to a a big tennis tournament. Um, Indian Wells, it's called. It's like further than Palm Springs, next to Coachella. It's called Indian Wells, and it's one of the top ten biggest tennis tournaments in the world. And I went there, and they had a booth for the best rackets, the booth for the best tennis ball, the booth for the clothing. And then they had one booth, which was uh, energy jewelry. And then I went in this booth and I looked and they were selling some special beads that you could select. And with those beads, you could make yourself a little uh, wristband. And that wristband was supposed to realign your energy and get you to uh, uh, expel energy and all these different things. And then I, I felt like a... I was aware though, listening to all of this, because it's like, how can the wristband get you to be healthier? It's, it's, I mean, in English, they call it snack oil, you know? <laughs> so I was listening to that. But then they told me, yeah, but this famous tennis player, this famous tennis player, and, and in fact, a lot of famous tennis players, that's why they were at the tennis tournament. And it seems that, I mean, this place was packed of people buying this thing. And so it seems to be known by so many people that famous tennis player and sports player or whatever had that brass and wristband for that energy thing. Wouldn't these people want to buy this uh, shoe that is helping you relief the same as your hand and so forth? Anyway, I see Andres as his end up. Go ahead. So I was just going to say that um, I think there was it might have been the same product or like a similar product. It was called like a power band. Yes. And they were like supposed to help with like, um, what was it? I don't remember exactly how to put it, but like it was basically a scam and it was just like holographic stickers in the, in the bracelets that made everyone think that it would like, uh, you would play better and stuff like that. I yeah. think it was for balance or something. Yeah. Like oh, a yeah. power balance. I think it was what it's, was called yeah yeah yes that's right there was a balance there was one that was a cable looking thing for power and i saw that one that was a different day versus this one was more like a titanium magnesium this and that and you would uh yeah you would sort of you know i mean right or wrong I don't know, but I would look into that. Could you, could by looking into that, that you find that there's a, uh, a fashion jewelry company that is very successful with their band. And it's not just since last year and it's a scam. They're just successful and people love the design. If it works or doesn't work. And then that would be the perfect company to, to collaborate and have the special shoes with the same, the same thing where you would have it, this on your wrist, it would be for this, this, and this, and that, and this. And then you would have this for the shoes, and it would be this, this, and this, and this, and that. I remember there was, um, I think it still exists, Sharper Image. Remember Sharper Image? Anyone knows this company called Sharper Image? Electronic store, I think. Well, Sharper Image, it, they do electronics, but it was a store. They went like Brookstone. Yes, exactly, like Brookstone, that was selling accessories uh, to travel, for comfort, for relaxation. You know, so the typical thing they would sell would be like a, like a, it looked like a little fan, but that fan would have some property that would remove a bad air. You know bad air and so um that reminds me this weekend i went to see uh, uh, 
a friend who's a very, I mean, very wealthy. I mean, he was, there was like famous celebrity there. And, um, and I saw some two fans <clears throat> in the living room. And I say, oh, what are, what are these fans? They look strange. I didn't even know they were fans, actually. I say, what are these? They say, it's a fan. I say, wow, that's a fan? And I've never seen this fan. And he said, yeah, it's a coronavirus fan. And I said, what? A coronavirus fan? What does it do? It filters the air and catches the coronavirus and clean the coronavirus from the air. And I was like, wow, they have the coronavirus fan. And so that was the type of thing that you could buy from, sharp, from sharper image and Brookstone. And they would sell, you know, the, the, some kind of things that you would put on your shoulder to relax your shoulder. Um, um, an accessory you would put on your head and you massage your head. And, you know, and it, the, the, that shoe would be perfect for them. They went bankrupt, but I don't think the, this, the need for a store like this um, has disappeared. Probably has got bigger since after the coronavirus. And therefore there's brands that would want to collaborate that you could think of and therefore, you're not looking for the brand, but you're looking for the opportunity. What would be the opportunity? Would be if you find it. Right now, I'm making it up. Like it would be that there is, you know, due to the coronavirus and people's uh, reflection over um, health and immunity and well-being. Um, there are stores, new stores or old stores, like if Sharper Image. I would not be surprised that Sharper Image still exists. I, think, I wouldn't be surprised they went bankrupt, so they, they got smaller. And there's some uh, wealthy individual bought the, the name and restarted it somewhere, where before they had stores, and now I'm, it's probably just a website or something. You know, that's usually what happens when you have something that famous, is the brand doesn't go away, just the retail store disappears. And so to take that direction, and, and sell the shoes from a collaboration, you know, like a licensing through, um, through these. That would be interesting. Would that work? I think it would work. It would work. Because again, what you need to understand, and that's why I know I, for you the class becomes more interesting, is because you've got the knowledge about what is marketing. You've got the knowledge about what's the environment that, you, that you're surveying, that you're researching the micro macro environment. Why do you do that? You do this because you need to create a SWOT analysis. Why do you do a SWOT analysis? You do a SWOT analysis because you need to come up with a growth direction that's gonna give you an idea which will help you develop some strategies. And you develop some strategies because a business needs to grow. But a business needs to grow because it needs to understand the consumers. Who are the consumers? So that was consumer behavior. Then this followed segmentation, targeting, and positioning. So you need to understand who you're selling it to. And that's why now it becomes interesting is who are we selling it to and how best to sell it to these people, okay? Do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, when you said the sharper image store, um, I don't think, I think you're right that yes, like the, the, the need for a store like that is, is, is not, like it's, it's still needed. And yeah. I think it still exists, and I, but I think it's actually exi existent more on the marketing side. I feel like that's what like drop shipping is now because it's mostly like gimmicky products like fidget spinners and stuff like that. Yeah. They're still on the market, but yeah, instead of spending money like Sharper Image did to 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 mass produce these items and market them, yeah. what, what's happening now is people just market an item and they see how that takes off and then they make the product. So I think that the whole market is still there. It's just evolved to be more marketing directed and i feel like maybe yeah. we could do that with the shoes too maybe yeah, we but, can create a demand for them yeah yes i see what you're saying the thing is yes it, so what you're saying is and thank you for saying that because it helps me direct you in your in your thoughts is here's the problem is um you know it reminds me when i was uh, in my 20s uh, you know everybody has hobbies and sometimes they're weird but I like 
to go uh, look for uh, antiques and used stuff and all that. So I would go to a antique store and I would look at all different things. I just like, maybe I'll buy some vi vinyl discs, you know? So, I mean, like, for example, in 97, you could, people gave away the vinyl discs, but to me, they still meant something. Now I'm happy to, that it's, it's being revived, but to me, that was always worth something. Not all of them, but certain and so forth. So I, I always like this concept of collecting, buying and selling and all that. So I would go to these stores, but it was um, a, a luck of the day. You know, you go in the store, one, one day you'll find something and another day you'll find nothing. And so then in the 90s, then I, I said, you know, I'll use the internet and hallelujah, eBay was created. And eBay became dangerous for me and people like me dangerous because what I used to look for and have to go into 50 store with eBay, I could find it every day. That unique piece, collector piece. So they were all there. And so what eBay did is it concentrated the geeks that were looking for collectors to go on eBay. And they, they, they was, they was, you became more addicted after eBay was created than before, I think, because there was a, a surplus of, of, of what you thought was unique. And so I think if everybody comes up with a great idea and everybody individually, separately, independently launch their idea, they can get successful. I'm not saying they never get successful, but it's more difficult than if it's within, um, concentrated, a centralized format. Because what the centralized format, so listen to, to the train of thoughts, which is the same it was 25 years ago and the same it's gonna be in 25 years, is because you have to look for the consumers and it's always expensive to look for the consumers. So it's true, through the internet, through social media. So social media, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was super cheap, like sort of free. The internet, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was so cheap that it was sort of free, but not anymore because now there's barrier to entry. And what happens is people, there's so many choices that they get lost. So if you come up with this great idea and you put it somewhere, it, it's not like it never happens. It does happen. It's like the lottery. There's eventually one person that wins it, but it's very few compared to the numbers. So it's the proportion is very small versus if you have, a specific profile, which is, I'm looking for things that are high tech that can help with my, with my, um, my needs for better medical health and all that. And it's sort of concentrated, centralized, and in a way was centralized under sharper image. It's easier because these people can't go to a thousand places during the day, but they can go to three, four, five places during the day. And if these three, four, five places are sort of centralizing things of the same thought for the same kind of people, it makes it easier. And so what I'm saying is the grounded shoes is sort of a, a, a extra help for people's health, for people that believe in natural medicine. And if there is an, one centralized places where there's more and more of those places, products, sorry, being um, offered, I think it would help us to find how could we collaborate with either the, the whatever store that provides this or with some brands that provide things like the end bracelet I was talking about there and um, um, the wristband that we could collaborate with and that would add an additional product in their portfolio. Why am I saying that? It's because now we're talking about the product mix decision. So the product mix decision is how do you add a product in an existing product portfolio? So thank you for, for uh, I, I can't see your name, you just talked. But, oh, um, Ali, Ali. Ali, thank you Ali yeah. for, uh, yeah, for what you're saying, because it, it is true that there is room to go independently, but I think it's, it's a question of where to follow the customers. 
So the same thing for product mix. You see, every um, job has a bias. And the bias of a, of a marketing person is that they absolutely love creating new products. That's a bias. And the, the problem is a new product doesn't always uh, succeed. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it eats away a lot of resources before anything, if anything. And it distracts from what we are doing right now. And it's sort of a distraction. It's like newer is better. So marketers have this bad bias of thinking the new product, their next baby is better. You know, it is true that there's a huge component of creativity in marketing. And therefore there's a lot of people that like marketing because of the creativity. But that becomes uh, a, a danger uh, because you just want to create new products. So when do you, should you create new products? Well, you should create new products when you identify a need. It's not, and the need is not you getting bored and wanting to create a new product. Is the need is the consumer are looking for a solution to a problem that is clearly identified and that you have the strength in responding to. So it's a strength and an opportunity. When there's this, then there's all kinds of steps. So we'll talk about it after this subject, which is called new product development. But the idea is you need to also look to see if you have the budget, and then you need to make some forecasts to make sure that you can make some money in a uh, not too long amount of times. And so the product mix is therefore to think about where is it going to be added? Is it going to be added to an existing category? Right? And so this is called the depth. Is it going to be a new category? This is called the width. So it's a, you're selling motorcycles, and now you're going to sell a plane. That becomes the width. You're selling motorcycle, and you're going to sell just a slightly different motorcycle. This is called the depth. So if you increase a product within an existing category, and it's just a, like a family extension, a close, very close extension. So, you know, like you're selling vanilla yogurts, and then the next one is it's going to be caramel yogurt, and the next one is going to be toffee yogurt. It sells within this flavored yogurt. So it's just a depth. But suddenly you say, you know what, we're also going to do ice cream, Make cream, milk, dairy product, it's not connected, but it's not a yogurt. So then that becomes the width. And then the length is the total number of products that you're selling. So the sum, the sum is the length, the depth is the, an evolution within an existing category. So it's an addition. And then the width is an addition, but for something that is different. Now, um, so here, trucks, cars, and vans, that's the width. Then the trucks, passenger, commercial, and farm related, that's the depth. Depth is within the, the, the specific uh, style versus uh, width is a different style that creates a different thing. Okay. So if we look at this, and this is from General Food Corporation. If I say, what is the width? You know, um, how many products width is General Food? What's the product width? How many? So the, the product width. Yes. Six. Six. That's correct, Brian. So there's six products in the width. There's dessert, coffee, cereals, pet foods, beverages, and household products. So that's six, the width. But then if I say, and uh, maybe Brian, you can help us. What about the beverages? What is the depth? How many? Four. Four, exactly. So the depth is the variation within the category versus the width is the variation of categories, right? So which one overall like that? And maybe if you don't mind, Brian, I'll ask you again. Which one do you think is more work for a business to create? A product width or a product depth?
Um, I would think with. Exactly. The product with is more work because it's a new category. So it's, it has more steps, more work, more things that you need to anticipate. So, because usually within the depth, there's a small change between all the products, or at least not, not a small change. To be more accurate, I, say, I should say a smaller change. So there's a smaller change in the depth than there is in the width, uh, if all things are considered, okay? So to move on, this is the same, but you know, Procter & Gamble, what's Procter & Gamble? Um, Uh, with five. five and then what's the uh, what's the depth of the shampoo those so it's two yeah so there's two um, so that's not too difficult to understand that now what's more difficult is when you think of a new product is where does it fit and so you have to use this. Now, um, this concept is about the stretch. So the product line stretch, which is in terms of, you know, normally a, a product line, a good product line is called consistent. So if, you, if we go back to this one, Procter & Gamble, what is the consistency here? Detergent, soup, shampoo, toothpaste. So here the consistency is to wash. Detergent, soap, shampoo, toothpaste. Wash your dish, wash the floor, wash your dishes, wash your body. Wash. So then the last one, potato chips. So that's kind of strange. It's not very consistent. Normally, when you develop a product line, you advocate for consistency. Or if you don't advocate for consistency, you have to explain the, um, the reason why you're gonna step out of the traditional uh, uh, things that, you, that you're working on. Like here, they, have to, they start making potato chips. So maybe because they have two divisions. One is uh, cleaning products and the other one is um, snacks. So in the snacks, they have potato chips, they have um, chocolates or something like that, right? So within the division, but also you have this concept of stretch. So the concept of stretch is different because this time is in terms of the premium, premiumization of the product line. So if you're known to have products that are low-end products, you know, cheaper products, lesser quality products, you may decide to, uh, to improve the image of the product to become more premium. And in this process, you may be doing this because there's a change of consumers. So they want things more expensive, higher quality, maybe because there's a change of the market with competitors disappearing and less competition in that segment maybe because you uh, want to improve your overall image and also increase your uh, overall profit margin. And so it could be all kinds of reason. So you go up, upward and improve by upward stretching your product line. Or you could go the opposite where you have, let's say that's very common. You are a luxury brand and as a luxury brand, you decide that you want to sort of milk your um, high-end perceived value from the consumers. So you're going to make lower-end products. So you make perfume that are very expensive, and then you create another range of perfume that are not, you know, so it's like Armani perfume. They go from $500 and up, and then you create the Armani exchange perfume. They go from $50 to $150. So it's just different stretch. Okay. You can do it two way where you have the brand be done in, in different ways. So here's Mercedes Benz. And Mercedes Benz is kind of the, um, the one of the most iconic brand, I think, when it comes to downward stretch and upward stretch for the reason that 
often they have been using the same brand. So, you know, it's different than um, Toyota, for example, which they've created new brands in order to go upstretch, for example. So upward stretch for Toyota, it's a Lexus, um, which it was originally um, just a concept. And even the name Lexus um, is a coincidence because the concept and the project at the beginning was just to see if they could make a, a luxury Toyota and they could see that if they made the luxury Toyota, originally the only country where they could sell it was the US. So it was called Luxury Export US. And so the short for that was Lexus, um, Luxury Export US. And so that, that was the, not the intention to, to sell it, but just to ex explore. And as they explore this, they realized that they could sell a luxury um, Toyota. So they did try. And eventually they gave up and they just said, let's call it differently, Lexus. Mercedes is different. They use the same name until a few years ago where they started creating names. And then they even went further by uh, purchasing um, a special um, tune-up company called AMG, where they started using AMG as their sort of their upstretch uh, Mercedes. Obviously there's a very, very upstretch Mercedes called the Maybach but that's, um, um, that's uh, they have their own name uh, and no own logo and all that. And then a long time ago, they created a, a, a very downstretch Mercedes-Benz called the Smart, uh, which they also decided to call it a different name. But it's interesting that you, you see that uh, every brand and organization do that with uh, Volkswagen as an example doing upward or down stretch as well by using specific brand as they would use uh, Seat or Skoda or, or they would use Audi or they even used a, a Bugatti, which is a, a brand that they uh, revived uh, that disappeared. But they, why would you do up stretch, down stretch? Why do you have this kind of, why do you worry about this? to target different market groups. Exactly. Yes, who said that? That was me, Mano. Okay, sorry. So many, um, sorry, I, I couldn't see you. But that's exactly right. It's a e manual, okay. So manual is absolutely correct. Is the idea behind, the idea behind marketing should always be the target. So what is, and I go back to how I started the class. Is how can you be successful in marketing by doing STP? What does that mean? Give the people what the people want. So you do upward, downward stretch, not because you, you feel like it. It's because there is a need. There is a need. And you know, there's money to be made as well. Of course, there's a profit profit um, issue that the businesses want to make more profit, so they do things in order to make more money. But it's not just the money that has driven this. Is more important than that, because obviously we know companies want to make money. But is there someone at the end that wants what they want to do? And the answer is yes. If there's someone, there is a market. So targeting, understanding the concept of targeting. It's essentially, you know, after having done this since the early 90s, taught since 95, I can tell you that's the most important concept. I would even say in business altogether is what is business about? Business is about making money. How do you make money? You make money because you have identified a group of people that want something and you can deliver that something better than the other competitors. That's it. But what is difficult about this? Making the product better? Not really. Finding the money for running all of this? Not really. Understanding the strategy? Not really. Understanding the opportunity? Yeah. 
but specifically understanding the opportunity for the specific target and understanding the target. So essentially understanding targeting is require you to discover the opportunities in the new way the world, the market is being shaped by the new people entering the market. So for example, let me use an example and finish with this. Businesses that are in the luxury right now are changing luxury, totally changing luxury, not because of who's making luxury, but because of who's buying luxury. The luxury buyers that started about maybe eight, five years ago, that's really when it started, is very different than before. And the ones that are coming behind, which are still young right now, are also even more different than before. So the whole luxury is being redesigned. And so there's a, a, a change of order when it comes to luxury. And that's why the brands are changing. That's why the distribution is changing. That's why how people are buying is changing. Everything is changing because of the new targets and their new way of consuming. And so if you do not pay attention to the targets and how they change and therefore generate new opportunities, you will not be able to last.